Surveyors, engineers, and architects are never required to factor the supposed curvature of the Earth into their projects, providing another proof the world is a plane, not a planet. Canals and railways, for example, are always cut and laid horizontally, often over hundreds of miles, without any allowance for curvature. One surveyor, Mr. T. Westwood, wrote in the January 1896 Earth Review magazine, stating that, in leveling, I work from ordnance marks, or canal levels, to get the height above sea level. The puzzle to me used to be that over several miles each level was and is treated throughout its whole length as the same level from end to end, not the least allowance being made for curvature. One of the civil engineers in this district, after some amount of argument on each side as to the reason why no allowance for curvature was made, said he did not believe anybody would know the shape of the earth in this life. Another surveyor and engineer of 30 years wrote to the Birmingham Weekly Mercury, February 15, 1890, stating, I am thoroughly acquainted with the theory and practice of civil engineering. However bigoted some of our professors may be in the theory of surveying according to the prescribed rules, yet it is well known amongst us that such theoretical measurements are incapable of any practical illustration. All our locomotives are designed to run on what may be regarded as true levels, or flats. There are, of course, partial inclines or gradients here and there, but they are always accurately defined and must be carefully traversed. But anything approaching to eight inches in the mile, increasing as the square of the distance, could not be worked by any engine that was ever yet constructed. Taking one station with another all over England and Scotland, it may be stated that all the platforms are on the same relative level. The distance between eastern and western coasts of England may be set down as 300 miles. If the prescribed curvature was indeed as represented, the central stations at Rugby or Warwick ought to be close upon three miles higher than a cord drawn from the two extremities. If such was the case, there is not a driver or stoker within the kingdom that would be found to take charge of the train. We can only laugh at those of your readers who seriously give us credit for such venturesome exploits as running trains round spherical curves. Horizontal curves on levels are dangerous enough. Vertical curves would be a thousand times worse, and with our rolling stock constructed as at present, physically impossible. Engineer W. Winkler wrote into the Earth Review, October 1893, regarding the Earth's supposed curvature, stating, As an engineer of many years standing, I saw that this absurd allowance is only permitted in school books. No engineer would dream of allowing anything of the kind. I have projected many miles of railways and many more of canals, and the allowance has not even been thought of, much less allowed for. This allowance for curvature means this that it is eight inches for the first mile of a canal, and increasing at the ratio by the square of the distance in miles, thus a small navigable canal for boats, say thirty miles long, will have, by the above rule, an allowance for curvature of six hundred feet. Think of that, and then please credit engineers as not being quite such fools. Nothing of the sort is allowed. We no more think of allowing 600 feet for a line of 30 miles of railway or canal than of wasting our time trying to square the circle. The Suez Canal, which connects the Mediterranean Sea with the Gulf of Suez on the Red Sea, is a clear proof of the Earth's and water's non-convexity. The canal is a hundred miles long and without any locks, so the water within is an uninterrupted continuation of the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. When it was constructed, the Earth's supposed curvature was not taken into account. It was dug along a horizontal datum line, 26 feet below sea level, passing through several lakes from one sea to the other, with the datum line and the water's surface running perfectly parallel over the 100 miles. The average level of the Mediterranean is 6 inches above the Red Sea, while the flood tides in the Red Sea rise 4 feet above the highest and drop 3 feet below the lowest in the Mediterranean making the half-tide level of the Red Sea, the surface of the Mediterranean Sea, and the hundred miles of water in the canal, all a clear continuation of the same horizontal line. Were they instead the supposed curved line of globe-earthers, the water in the center of the canal would be 1,666 feet above the respective seas on either side. David Wardlaw Scott wrote, 
The distance between the Red Sea at Suez and the Mediterranean Sea is a hundred statute miles, the datum line of the canal being twenty-six feet below the level of the Mediterranean, and is continued horizontally the whole way from sea to sea, there not being a single lock on the canal. The surface of water being parallel with the datum line, it is thus clear that there is no curvature or globularity for the whole hundred miles between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Had there been, according to the astronomic theory, the middle of the canal would have been a thousand six hundred and sixty-six feet higher than at either end, whereas the canal is perfectly horizontal for the whole distance. The Great Canal of China, said to be seven hundred miles in length, was made without regard to any allowance for supposed curvature, as the Chinese believe the earth to be a stationary plane. I may also add that no allowance was made for it in the North Sea Canal, or in the Manchester Ship Canal, both recently constructed, thus clearly proving that there is no globularity in earth or sea, so that the world cannot possibly be a planet. Thomas Winship wrote, If the earth be the globe of popular belief, it is very evident that in cutting a canal, an allowance must be made for the curvature of the globe, which allowance would correspond to the square of the distance multiplied by eight inches. From the age of 5th August 1892, I extract the following. The German emperor performed the ceremony of opening the gates of the Baltic and North Sea Canal in the spring of 1891. The canal starts at Holtenau on the south side of Kiel Bay and joins the Elbe 15 miles above its mouth. It is 61 miles long, 200 feet wide at the surface, and 85 feet at the bottom, the depth being 28 feet. No locks are required, as the surface of the two seas is level. Let those who believe it is the practice for surveyors to make allowance for curvature ponder over the following from the Manchester Ship Canal Company, Earth Review, October 1893. It is customary in railway and canal constructions for all levels to be referred to a datum which is nominally horizontal and is so shown on all sections. It is not the practice in laying out public works to make allowances for the curvature of the earth. The London and Northwestern Railway forms a straight line 180 miles long between London and Liverpool. The railroad's highest point midway at Birmingham Station is only 240 feet above sea level. If the world were actually a globe, however, curveting 8 inches per mile squared, the 180-mile stretch of rail would form an arc, with the center point at Birmingham raising a full 5,400 feet above London and Liverpool, adding the station's actual height, 240 feet, to its theoretical inclination, 5,400 feet, gives 5,640 feet as the rail's necessary height on a globe earth, more than a thousand feet taller than Ben Nevis, the tallest mountain in Great Britain. Thomas Winship wrote, In projecting railways on a globe, the datum line would be the arc of a circle corresponding to the latitude of the place. That the datum line for the railway projections is always a horizontal line proves that the general configuration of the world is horizontal. To support the globe theory, the gentlemen of the observatories should call upon the surveyor to prove that he allows the necessary amount for curvature. But this is what the learned men dare not do, as it is well known that the allowance for the supposed curvature is never made. David Ward Scott wrote, In a long line like that of the Great Pacific Railway, extending across North America, the supposed curvature would, of course, be proportionally great, extending to many miles in height, but not one inch was allowed by the engineers for curvature during the whole course of the construction of that vast line of railway. And if we think of it, how could it be otherwise? All railway metals must of necessity be straight, for how could any engine or carriage run with safety on a convex surface? J. C. Bourne, in his book, The History of the Great Western Railway, stated that the entire original English railroad, more than 118 miles long, that the whole line, with the exception of the inclined planes, may be regarded practically as level. The British Parliament session in 1862 that approved its construction recorded in Order No. 44 for the proposed railway that the section be drawn to the same horizontal scale as the plan and to a vertical scale of not less than one inch to every 100 feet and shall show the surface of the ground marked on the plan, the intended level of the proposed work, the height of every embankment, and the depth of every cutting, and a datum horizontal line, which shall be the same throughout the whole length of the work. 
Thomas Winship wrote, 118 miles of level railway, and yet the surface on which it is projected a globe? Impossible. It cannot be. Early in 1898, I met a Mr. Hughes, chief officer of the steamer City of Lincoln. This gentleman told me he had projected thousands of miles of level railway in South America, and never heard of any allowance for curvature being made. On one occasion, he surveyed over 1,000 miles of railway, which was a perfect straight line all the way. It is well known that in the Argentine Republic and other parts of South America, there are railways thousands of miles long, without curve or gradient. In projecting railways, the world is acknowledged to be a plane, and if it were a globe, the rules of projection have yet to be discovered. Level railways prove a level world. To the utter confusion of the globular school of impractical men with high salaries and little brains, that in all surveys no allowance is made for curvature, which would be a necessity on a globe, that a horizontal line is in every case the datum line, the same line being continuous throughout the whole length of the work, and that the theodolite cuts a line at equal altitudes on either side of it, which altitude is the same as that of the instrument, clearly proves to those who will accept proof when it is furnished that the world is a plane and not a globe. If the earth were a sphere, airplane pilots would have to constantly correct their altitudes downwards so as to not fly straight off into outer space. If the earth were truly a sphere 25,000 miles in circumference, curvetting 8 inches per mile squared, a pilot wishing to simply maintain their altitude at a typical cruising speed of 500 miles per hour would have to constantly dip their nose downwards and descend 2,777 feet, over half a mile, every minute. Otherwise, without compensation, in one hour's time, the pilot would find themselves 166,666 feet, 31.5 miles, higher than expected. A plane flying at a typical 35,000 feet, wishing to maintain that altitude at the upper rim of the so-called troposphere, in one hour, would find themselves over 200,000 feet high in the mesosphere, with a steadily raising trajectory the longer they go. I have talked to several pilots, and no such compensation for the Earth's supposed curvature is ever made. When pilots set an altitude, their artificial horizon gauge remains level, and so does their course. Nothing like the necessary 2,777 foot per minute declination is ever taken into consideration. Thomas Winship wrote, It must be obvious to the reader that if the earth be the globe of popular belief, the rules observed for navigating a vessel from one part of this globe to another must be in conformity to its figure. The datum line in navigation would be an arc of a circle, and all computations would be based on the convexity of water and worked out by spherical trigonometry. Let me preface my remarks on the important branch of our subject by stating that at sea the datum line is always a horizontal line. Spherical trigonometry is never used, and not one out of one thousand shipmasters understands spherical trigonometry. Airline pilots and sea navigators fly and sail as though the earth were a plane. Pilots reach their desired altitude and maintain it effortlessly for hours, never contending with anything like the 2,777 feet per minute of forced inclination due to Earth's supposed curvature. Similarly, ship captains in navigating great distances at sea never need to factor the supposed curvature of the Earth into their calculations. Both plain sailing and great circle sailing, the most popular navigation methods, use plain not spherical trigonometry. From Navigation and Nautical Astronomy, plain sailing is usually defined to be the art of navigating a ship on the supposition that the Earth is a plane. Even when longitude enters into consideration, it is still with the plane triangle only that we have to deal. But as the investigation here given in the text shows, the rules for plane sailing would equally hold good though the surface were a plane. Thomas Winship wrote, it must be evident to everyone who understands what a triangle is that the base of any such figure on a globe would be an arc of a circle of which the center would be the center of the globe. Thus, instead of a plane triangle, the figure would contain one plane angle and two spherical angles. Hence, if the plane triangle is what we have to deal with, and such is the case, the base of the triangle would be a straight line, the ocean. That all triangulation used at sea is plane proves that the sea is a plane. 
The foregoing quotation states that a plane triangle is used for a spherical surface, but the rules for plane sailing would equally hold good though the surface were a plane. What fine reasoning! It is like saying that the rules for describing a circle are those used for drawing a square, but they would equally hold good though the figure were a square. Plain sailing is navigating a ship making all mathematical calculations on the assumption that the earth is perfectly flat. If the earth were, in fact, a sphere, such an errant assumption would lead to constant glaring inaccuracies, and the necessity for using spherical trigonometry would become obvious. Plain sailing has worked perfectly fine in both theory and practice for thousands of years, however, and plain trigonometry has time and again proven more accurate than spherical trigonometry in determining distances across the oceans. It is so commonly used at sea, navigation in theory and practice states that, in practice, scarcely any other rules are used but those derived from plain sailing. The great and serious objection to plain sailing is that longitude cannot be found by it accurately, although in practice it is more frequently found by it than any other method. So both latitude and longitude are found most often and most accurately by assuming the earth to be flat, more accurately even than assuming the earth to be spherical. Thomas Winship wrote, Plain sailing proves that the surface of water is a plane or horizontal surface, and in practice it is shown that this plane extends for many thousands of miles. Whether the voyage is outwards or homewards makes no difference, thus showing that a short voyage to the Cape and back to England can be accomplished by plain sailing. The fact that water is flat like a sheet of paper, when undisturbed by wind and tide, is my working anchor, and the powerful ground tackle of all those who reject the delusions of modern theoretical astronomy. Prove water to be convex, and we'll at once and forever recant and grant you anything you like to demand. William Carpenter wrote, if the earth were a globe, a small model globe would be the very best, because the truest thing for the navigator to take to sea with him. But such a thing as that is not known. With such a toy as a guide, the mariner would wreck his ship of a certainty. This is a proof that the earth is not a globe. As the mariner's compass points north and south at one and the same time, and a meridian is a north and south line, it follows that meridians can be no other than straight lines. But since all meridians on a globe are semicircles, it is an incontrovertible proof that the earth is not a globe. And David Ward Lascott wrote, The needle of this most important instrument is straight, its two ends pointing north and south at the same time. Consequently, the meridians must also be straight lines, whereas on a globe they are semicircles. Even at the equator, the needle points straight, which would be impossible were that the midway of a vast convex globe, as in such case, the one end would dip towards the north, and the other be pointed towards the sky. Again, the navigator, when he goes to sea, takes his observations and relies on the compass to guide him as to the direction in which he wishes to proceed. He does not provide himself with the model of a globe, which, if the world were a globe, would surely be the safest plan for him to adopt, but he takes flat maps or charts. Thus, in practice, he sails his ship as if the sea were horizontal, though in theory he had been erroneously taught that it is convex.